hey, it is really, really good to be with you this morning. <clears throat> we are going to wrap up our little two-week series entitled Placing Jesus in His Rightful Place. And uh, all of our uh, past couple of weeks have been stemmed out of Proverbs 3.6 uh, and putting that within the depths of our souls, learning to develop and cultivate a lifestyle of acknowledging God in all of our ways. And uh, if you weren't here <clears throat> last week, uh, I'll do a little recap for you. Last week we laid a very simple yet biblical foundation on what it looks like to develop a lifestyle of acknowledging God in all of our ways. We talked about how we acknowledge God through the word of God. It's probably a good place to start, right? And uh, we talked about how we can acknowledge God by beholding his creation and his nature, learning how to turn things off and open our eyes and realize that God is all around us. His creation is on display. And uh, this morning, we're going to uh, conclude our series by talking about how in the world do we cultivate a lifestyle of acknowledging God in all of our ways, specifically in the midst of trials and difficulties? Because trials, church family, and difficulties are inevitable in life. In fact, Scripture actually tells us, Scripture informs us that trials and challenges and difficulties are actually coming. It's not a matter of if they come, it's a matter of when they come, but don't take my word for it. This is what James, the brother of Jesus, writes in James 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the leading uh, or the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, count it all joy when you face trials? That's, that's an interesting way to look at that, and we'll jump into that here later this afternoon, or this, this morning, or evening, or whatever this is. Uh, listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 16 and 23. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you to speak or what you're to say. For what you will say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated uh, by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns in Israel before the Son of Man comes. If you're looking for a really uplifting, positive, and encouraged message, that's not it. Right? Like, can you imagine, like, you're hanging out with the Messiah. Right? You, you can touch him, and you can feel him, and you can smell him, and you can hear him. Like, you're walking in his footsteps, and the Messiah all of a sudden drops this bomb of a conversation and says, hey, BT Dub, I'm going to send you out as sheep amongst wolves. Well, really? Okay. And it kind of gets like worse. They're going to flog you. They're going to beat you. They're going to pull you into court. Hey, but don't worry. Holy Spirit will speak to you. We'll take care of that. Yeah, the one who endures to the end, they'll be saved. And then it kind of gets even like they're going to person, they're going to hate you because of me. Be encouraged, disciples. Be encouraged. Uh, hey, by show of hands, anybody ever been to a wedding? Not a trick question. It's okay. You can raise your hand. Been to a wedding? I've had the privilege of officiating 27 weddings. It's one of my favorite things in all the world to do. Like, you have got the best seat and the most celebratory day of an individual and individual's lives, right? Like, you're right there. And of the 27 weddings that I've done, the 27 weddings that I've officiated, I have never heard a vow between a bride and a groom go like this. Uh, for better and for richer. And health until we never die and we're never separated. 
In fact, I hear vows like this, for better, for richer, for in and in health till, like, hello, like you are acknowledging on the greatest day of your life that this is going to be really challenging at times. This is going to be hard. If you're a married couple, uh, marriage, not all the time is just wonderful and bliss. Marriage is difficult, amen? Oh, I had some strong amens at the nine. <laughs> Counseling at the nine, it's okay. Marriage is difficult at times. Life is challenging at times, but did you catch what Jesus says to the disciples in verse 22 of Matthew 10? He says this one-liner in the midst of you're going to be hated and flogged and beaten and thrown into courts. Jesus says this in Matthew 22, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, I'm an ESV guy. I don't know what version you are, but I'm guessing your version doesn't say, and the one who frolics to the end will be saved, right? I'm guessing your version doesn't say, and the one who just skips and dances to the end will be saved. I'm guessing your version is much like mine. The one who endures to the end will be saved. So that tells me one thing, church family, that life will throw us some curveballs, it may not look like what we think at times. In all reality, life may be challenging. It may be difficult. But I don't know about you, but every word that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, to the best of my ability, I am clinging to. And I love that Jesus says, to the one who endures to the end will be saved. There is hope, church family, in the midst of your trial. There is hope in the midst of your challenges. And I want to say this, that your hope only comes in and through and by Jesus. No one else. Nothing else. It is Jesus and Jesus alone is how you and I endure to the end. Can I get an amen? amen. So this morning we're going to walk through scripture and find some practicals and glean from the life of David on how he acknowledged God in the midst of trials. Does that sound good? Turn with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63, we're going to pick it up. 11 o'clock, are we alive this morning? Are we okay? We got some burritos that if you need to eat something, we can, we can hook you guys up. It's okay. Psalm 63, we're going to kick it up in verse 1. It says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Verse 5, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shout of your wings I will sing for joy. Verse 8, my soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Scholars believe that David writes Psalm 63 on the run for his life. You see, David has a daughter by the name of Tamar. And scripture describes Tamar as beautiful. She's stunning. David has many sons. One of his sons uh, goes by the name of Amnon. And Amnon is uh, unfortunately falling in love with his half-sister. And Amnon throws this fit that he can't do anything about being in love with his half-sister. So Amnon gets this awful, awful advice from a friend. And this advice essentially says, hey, you're the king's kid. You should be able to do whatever you want to do. So Amnon unfortunately takes this terrible advice and he does something atrocious to Tamar, his half-sister. Absalom comes in the scene. Absalom is the full brother of Tamar and the half-brother of Amnon. And Absalom is livid 
and rightfully so. And Absalom is waiting for David, the dad, the king here, to do something about what Amnon did to Tamar. Scripture says David got angry, and that was about it. David didn't do anything, so Absalom takes justice into his own hands and has his own half-brother killed. Absalom flees, he dips, he runs away. Finally, he comes back, but David, you know, doesn't want to have any conversations with him. Hello, passive-aggressive, right? And uh, Absalom is infuriated at David. And so Absalom forms this this militia, if you will, this, this army of men. And as he's forming this army, man, Absalom has actually convinced this army that he's the king. When in all reality, David is fully alive and still the king. So Absalom has this, this, this band of, of, of misfits, if you will, gathering together as an army with one goal in mind. And that goal is this, to dethrone David by killing David. So here we have Absalom pretending he's this king, but really not. When all reality, Absalom is this outraged son with daddy issues seeking justice for his sister. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the emotions David must have been feeling? Like, can you imagine you're like, you're king. Like, you're the man. Like, you've gone to war after war after battle after battle, and you've been victorious. Like, there's nothing you can't do, and you get word that your own son has killed one of your other sons because of what that son did to your daughter. And then that son has fled and now has formed a militia, an army, and he is seeking to kill you, David. Now, I don't know what your challenges are, but I hope they are nothing like this. Like, I can look at my bad days sometimes like, ah, my bad days are not all that bad. Right? It's like, hey, if you want to look at some bad days, go read the Old Testament. Like, there's some bad days in there, right? David's life, you could argue, is coming off the hinges. And and I can only imagine what what David is feeling in this this emotion that he's got to be in, knowing that his own flesh and blood is out to dethrone him by killing him. Can you imagine the emotions? Fear? Fear? Anger, sadness, anxiety, depression, maybe all of the above at one point. Have you ever felt those emotions before? You've been in a trial in life. Maybe you're currently in a challenge or a difficult time in life. And you're like, oh, I can relate to all those emotions. You see, David felt those emotions. He knew what it was like. He knew what it felt felt like to face challenges in life. But what I want to point out to us this morning, church family, is David knew how to acknowledge the Father in the midst of his challenges. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So if you have your notes, I encourage you to take this down. The first thing we see David doing is this. We see David confessing. Now, what is David confessing? He's not confessing his sin, but he is confessing this in verse 1. Oh, God, you are my God. Hey, just real quick, at a show of hands, has anybody ever felt with challenges in life? Anybody ever dealt with those? It's okay. It's church, right? Like, all the time, right? Like, I, I haven't just been through a hard season in life. I've been through multiple difficult seasons in life. And I love David's confession is this, oh God, you are my God. So if you've ever faced a challenge, if you're, or when you face a challenge, or maybe you already are, I want to encourage you in this. A good starting point for your soul is this, confessing, oh God, you are my God. Because I don't know about you, that's the last thing my flesh wants to confess in that moment. My flesh wants to confess this, I cannot believe you're letting this happen to me. I'm a tither. And you're letting this happen to me. Like I go to life group and you're letting this happen to me. Look, look at all this stuff. Can you imagine? I don't know if David's thinking this. Like, God, I, man, I slayed that giant for you. Remember that. Everybody else was like shaking in their little sandals, but not me. I crushed that guy for you. 
Remember that? But, but David's not there yet. He's needing to plumb line his soul by confessing, oh God, you are my God. Now, I don't know about your tendency, but this is my tendency when I'm facing challenges in life is I, I'm okay with confessing that, but I'm not okay with sitting in that. Does that make sense? So I'm good at saying, oh, God, you're my God, you're my rock, you're my salvation, awesome, wonderful. What's next? Right? Like, how do I get myself out of this situation? You know what I'm talking about? Like, what do we need to do? What's the strategy? What's the why? What's the how? What's the what? What do I need to do to remove myself from this? But I want to encourage us this morning, my, myself included, church family, rather than asking what's next or the why or the strategy, what if we actually just sat there for just a moment and we acknowledged God for who he is? So, so this is what this looks like. You ready for this? For me, this is what that looks like. Man, I, finances and, and the kids and the family and, and the school and, and all the challenges and the issues and the circumstances. And it's swirling me. It's surrounding me. So this is what I'm learning to do. I'm learning just to shh and stay right here for a moment. God, you're my God. And I'm learning, I don't need the why yet, I don't need the what yet, I don't need the strategy yet. I need to learn to sit right here in this moment, in this posture, acknowledging, not my challenges, but acknowledging, oh God, you are my God. So this is my encouragement, stop trying to fix it. Just, just stop. I'm all for working with God and him with us. Yes and amen. I'm not sitting here, I'm not saying just sit around and twiddle your thumbs. Like you're gonna need to get up at one point. But in a moment, you just need to sit and be still and acknowledge he is God. You see, when we acknowledge, when we confess who he is and we allow our souls to sit in it, that fear actually turns to peace. Well, that's easy to preach, right? I'm not gonna put a time frame out. I'm not God. Remember, his ways are not my ways, nor are they yours. His thoughts are not your thoughts or mine, and his timing is not yours or mine, right? But I will acknowledge him, saying this moment right here of me doing nothing but just acknowledging you is actually worth it. Heidi Baker once said, spending time with God, there is no waste. There is no waste when you spend time with God. What if we acknowledge God in our challenges rather than acknowledging our challenges? Like, I'm, uh, uh, hear me in this. You can acknowledge the challenge for sure. It's hard, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's all the emotions which are legitimate. But if we are, oh, if we are worshiping that acknowledgement, other than worshiping the acknowledgement of who he is, oh, church family, we're off. I, I can be over here quite a bit. I cannot believe we're going through this again. Man, didn't we just discipline our kids about this? I cannot believe we're having this conversation. It's not just, shh, God, you are my God. And I will sit here until it gets into the depths of my soul, and then I will move on. It's countercultural church family. But I want to remind us the kingdom we have been grafted into is not of this world. So don't put logic of this world on top of God. It won't work. It won't work. So, number one, how do we acknowledge God in the midst of our trials and our situations? We confess, oh God, you are my. God, and we plumb line our soul off of that foundation. Y'all, we're not even through halfway of verse one. Y'all ready? The other half of verse one, earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Did you see who David is seeking? It is the father. 
He is not seeking the why. He is seeking the Father. He is not seeking strategy. He is seeking the Father. He is not coming to the Father saying, I've got all the riches in the world. I've got all the resources in the world. i got enough men to take care of my son who is irate with me. He is not seeking anything other than the Father. So in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our challenges, I want to pose a question, a vulnerable question. Who or what are we seeking? What's the first thing you seek? Social media? What, what, what is it? Box score? I'm guilty of that. What, what, what's the thing you seek? Food? Relationships? Control? Security? Can I just say all those, they're empty compared to Jesus. Yes, let's walk in the context of a spiritual family. Yes and amen. But our first go-to in the time of trouble is I am seeking the Father. I was going through a challenging, I mean challenging time in life. And... um, I was reading the Psalms, and I'm like, man, David's an emotional basket case, okay? So I can relate to this a little bit. So I'm like, I'm just all over the place with God. And uh, the question I was asking is, why? why? Why is this happening to me? Like, man, Lord, I thought, I thought we were good. Like, I, I thought we were doing this thing together. Why me? And so for six months my prayer life was, was screaming at God, why, why, why? And for six months, you want to know what I heard the Father say? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And I got so frustrated. Well, why aren't you saying this? And now my why is even directed in other ways. Then all of a sudden, just this, the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, he's just so kind and so gentle. You're asking the wrong question. What question should I be asking? Just seek me. Seek me. So for six months, I'm, I'm so caught up in the why and heard nothing. My, my, my heart posture was off. I was seeking something other than the Father. I'm okay with the why. And I'm okay now not ever knowing the why. Are we okay with that sometimes? With the things we're going through in life, are we okay with never understanding maybe the why behind what is happening? That's that's a hard resolve to get to. But I will say this, in order to get to that resolve, we must earnestly seek the Father first and foremost. So who should we seek in the time of trouble? This is a no-brainer, right? It's God. Are we doing that? Or do I, just, do I just check out? Do I just try to escape? That, that can be my tendency. Like this is, this is too daunting. This is too overwhelming. I'll just escape. Like dad's here, husband's here, friend is here, but mentally I'm checked out. Anybody else can relate? Just me, praise God. It's like, I don't want to escape to anybody but Jesus. And I know that sounds cliche and like the thing to say in church, but y'all, it's reality. This, 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 is, this is the access we have. Let me remind us, the veil's been torn. God's not hiding behind some confessional waiting for you. He has given us full access to him. So why would we run to anyone or anything else? It's pride, it's selfishness, the list goes on. I can say it because that's me, right? But if I remind myself, you've you've torn the veil, you've ripped the curtain, you're not hiding behind something, I don't have to go to nine priests and then confess that and show this to get to you. Like you're, you're here, you've given me access to you. I would be a fool to run to anybody but you. Anybody, anything but the Father. So we see David in the midst of his life unraveling, confessing, oh God, you are my God. 
We see him throwing himself in desperation. Earnestly, I seek you. This is what else he says. Verse 2, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life. Are you ready for this, church? My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Oh, come on. Like we heard it from James. Like consider it like joy, pure joy when you face this stuff. I don't want to consider it pure joy. I really don't. It's not the thing I'm just excited about. Like trials, right? I don't want to, right? But but David even says in the midst of his life coming off the hinges, he says this, I will praise you with, there's that word, joyful lips. Like, really? Do I have to? No. This is what I tell my children all the time. You don't have to. You get to. You get to. Why? Because remember, he's torn the curtain. He's lifted the veil. He's given us access that even in the midst of our trials and our challenges and difficulties, he has made a way in and through his son to rejoice in him with joyful lips. Now this, my friends, is outrageously difficult to do. I, uh, over the summer, uh, you, you know when you just ask God, I don't know if you ask these questions, like, God, is there anything you want me to do? Like, that's a dangerous question. <laughs> dangerous, right? Uh, so if you're not ready to be, like, radically obedient, I would highly recommend not asking that question. Guys, is there anything you want me to do? Like, I thought, like, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's go fishing. I don't know. And he told me to do something radical. And I'm like, Really? That? Anything else you want me to do? <laughs> and you know, I like said on this for like a month. And I'm like, man, if, if I do this deal, God, this, this is crazy. This is crazy, right? Like I'm trying to put logic all over this. I'm crunching the numbers. I'm crossing the T's and I'm like, this just doesn't add up. And I, I can't, I can't get let go of this deal. I'm, I, I bring it to my wife. I'm like, surely she'll say no. Surely she goes, yeah, you should totally do that. I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, okay, well, well, here we go. Obedience. Here we go. And uh, I'm like, oh man, that that happened. And I, I felt like I was at this crossroads, if you will. Hey, I can throw a pity party on what I just did in response of obedience, or I can praise you with joyful lips. What confession will I land on? So this is what I did. Thanks, God. So I'm kind of working myself up a little bit in my closet. Thank you, Jesus. Like, I don't want to do this right now, right? Hello, discipline. Thanks, God, for the journey you've had me on my whole life. Okay, thank you, Jesus, for faith. And uh, I thank, Lord, your word says, without faith it's impossible. So that tells me it's possible to please you through faith. So I'm walking in faith. Just reminder, walking in faith, needing you to show up. And I'd love for you to show up really soon, because that is nuts. <laughs> so I'm thanking you, Lord. And then I put this song on by Brian and Katie Torwell. I will praise before my breakthrough. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm going to praise before my breakthrough. I need some breakthrough. We all need some breakthrough, right? But do we want to praise before that? Typically, we'd like to praise after that, right? Upside down kingdom. So here we go. I'm praising you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm a man of faith. and I'm walking by faith to the best of my ability. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, right? Fast forward the story. And I'm like, I'm working out with one of my good buddies. And he says, hey, man, I noticed. I noticed you sold your car. And I go, well, crazy, right? He goes, what are you doing? I go, I don't know. He goes, well, what are you going to do? No clue. Absolutely no idea. And without blinking an eye, he goes this, well, hey, man, why don't you just come up? I got a third one. I'll just give it to you. And I thought, I praise. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. 
But here's what I learned in the midst of all of this. Whether it comes when I want it to come or whether it doesn't, will I praise him in the midst of my challenges? It was a challenge to do what I did. Like, Lord, forgive me if I was in delayed obedience, but that was a hard one to do, right? Like, I got no plan B. But here we go, Lord, I'm doing this, and you're going to teach me that in the midst of trials and challenges and difficulties, and when it doesn't add up, will you praise me? And can I just say this? Oh, this is, this is a dangerous road to play. If we praise him to get an outcome, we are sorely mistaken. I don't praise him to get an outcome. I don't praise him to get an answered prayer. I praise him because he's worthy. I praise him because this is what scripture calls me, not requires, calls me into. So may our praise never be for an outcome. May our praise never be for the breakthrough. May it always be because you're worthy and it's my joy to glorify you, even when it doesn't make sense. You think David is posted up on his little horse thinking, well, he could kill me today. Uh, you know what? I think I'll just praise. What do you think his men were thinking? David's lost it. He's, he's gone crazy. But David could care less what people think. Remember when he says, you watch this. I'll be even more undignified than right here, right now. So it doesn't matter what situation or circumstance David is in. He is resolved with every fiber of his being to praise him with joyful lips. Church family, I, it's hard. It's challenging. It's difficult. But it's absolutely worth it. This is what we get to do. As disciples, of followers of Jesus, we get to worship him, praise him in the midst of our challenges, not just with lips, but with joyful lips. Can I just say one last thing on this piece? He's not looking for disgruntled worship. Great. Is it 930 yet so the worship can be over? He's not looking for it. He's looking for joyful worship. Like, pure from the heart. Remember, Samuel's like, hey, man, where, where's, the, where's the sons? Where are your brothers? And uh, this, that got to be the guy. He's the next king. And what does is, what is God say? I'm not looking at the outward appearance. It's that heart that I'm after. And what has David known? A man after God's own heart. David gets this church family. What if? What if we begin to worship and praise and bless him with joyful lips, what would our family say? Come on, parents, what would your kids say? What if they joined along? Miracle, right? What would your coworkers say? What would your boss say? Man, Johnny's just whistling that tune like crazy. He's about to get laid off. <laughs> What's going on here? What if? What if we actually acknowledged him in all of our ways, including acknowledging him in our challenges through worshiping him with joyful lips? Stay with me. We're almost finished. Let me end with this, verse 6. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Let me pause there. What do you meditate on at night? When you go to bed at night, what are you thinking about? Here's what I think about sometimes. Great, it's Monday tomorrow you got to be kidding me. I'm so not prepared. And then I'll meditate on that, right? What do you meditate on at night? Here, here's another silly thing that I do. It's, it sounds shallow because it is. I, I hope the Cubs won tonight. Like, I'm thinking about it. Like, they're two and a half out of the pennant race. And, man, if we can do this still, like, I'm thinking about it. I'm meditating. I'm like, are you, you are a shallow human being. <laughs> like, I'm pep-talking myself. Get off the box score, Right? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying that's sinful. What I'm saying to you is what I'm saying to me. What are we meditating on at night? When we put our head on that pillow, what is it? Is it the goodness? Is it the faithfulness of God? Or is it great? It's Monday again. Oh, it's payroll another three weeks from now. What has our attention? I love that David says, when I remember you. Oh, church, don't think that he cultivated this lifestyle in the palace. He cultivated this in the pasture. When I remember, I remembered 
man, when you were with me and I took down Goliath, I remember. When nobody else was around and my brothers are at like this epic heroic war and I'm tending dad's sheep in the back country. Like, I remember when that lion came and by your grace and power, I killed it. I remember when that bear, Lord, I remember. What if we started remembering the goodness and the faithfulness of God in the midst of our challenges? What if we started, stopped focusing on how hard this is and how faithful he is? Now, again, I'm not negating. This is challenging. It is difficult. Don't be naive. It is hard. But it does not trump the faithfulness of the Father. David says, I'll remember you at night. I'll meditate on you when I'm overlooking, watching out. I will think of you constantly. And this is the last thing that we'll talk about this morning. David says this in verse 8, My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. All of us, I don't care how strong you are, how talented you are, how gifted or, or how anointed you are, we all need to cling to an anchor in life. All of us. And can you see the heart posture of David, you see where his soul ends up clinging to the Father. Not looking for strategy, not looking for the why, not looking for a way out, not all too worried if he's going to go on living or if his own son's going to kill him. He is clinging to the Father. He does it by confessing, Oh God, you're my God. He does it by desperately seeking, longing for the Father. His soul clings to him as he worships and praises and blesses, not with lips, but with joyful lips. His soul clings to him as he remembers the faithfulness of God. By show of hands, just out of curiosity, anybody's soul need to cling to the Father? Like always. Not, not just in my hard times. I need to cling to him in my good times because I'll botch those real fast. Like church family, we need to live in a state of desperation. We need to live in a state of longing for our souls to cling to the Father. Not just uh, in, in, in the difficult times, but in the great times as well. This is who we get to be, church family. We get to worship him as we stare at that mountain. We get to remind ourselves of his faithfulness when the numbers aren't adding up. This is what we're called to do as disciples, as followers of Jesus. The one who endures to the end will be saved. You want to know how you endure? You confess, oh God, you're my God, no other, no other. You worship, you bless, you praise with joyful lips. You live a lifestyle of acknowledging him in good times as well as hard times. Church family, I want you to stand to your feet. Hey, we, we say that we're a spiritual family. It's moments like this where that comes to a reality. Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I, I need to cling to the Father. I've been clinging to my relationship. I've been clinging to my phone. I've been clinging to my bank account. I've been clinging to control. I've been clinging to something else. Maybe this morning you need to come to the front, get on your knees, on your face. It is not up to me how you position yourself. But it is a moment to say, if you need to cling to the Father, remember he's made a way for you. And it's in and through Jesus. And how we cling to the Father as we confess, oh God, you're my God. How we cling to the Father as we earnestly, fervently seek him. How we cling to the Father as we worship him with joyful lips. How we cling to the Father as we remind ourselves of his faithfulness. If that's you, that's me this morning, I need to cling to the Father. I want to encourage you to respond. 
you need to stand there, stand there. If you need to come to the front, come to the front. If you need to get on your knees, then get on your knees. This is when we are a spiritual family. Moments like this. If you're here this morning and you have never, ever made a decision to fully surrender your life to Jesus, he is the only way you'll endure to the end. And if you want to endure to the end, if you want to accept Jesus and begin following his ways, I'm not going to make you pray a prayer. I'm not going to make you come down. Here's what I encourage you to do. Between you and Jesus, you confess with your mouth that he is Lord. and You believe it in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And scripture says that you'll be saved. You can have a relationship with Jesus again. If you're here and you're wanting a relationship, it's that simple. He doesn't make it hard, but he does want all of you. So, Father, we say thank you with joyful lips in the midst of our challenges. Thank you. We will bless you. We will praise you as the mountain is staring us in the eyes. We will remember your goodness and your faithfulness. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you guide us in this moment? We put our hope and trust in you. And it's in Jesus' name.